In this episode, we discuss 2020's The Wolf of Snow Hollow. We attempt to tease apart who is and who isn't a werewolf. We discuss toxic masculinity. We also touch upon the psychological concept of object relations. I hope you enjoy it. John? Brian, hello. How's it going? It's going well. Did you hear the wolf howling last night? Yeah, I thought that was you. It was a bellowing, and mm. uh, it was quite close. Yeah, yeah, it was alarming to me as well, and there was a full moon on top of it, which can't be good. Mm-mm, no. Uh, it reminded me of uh, The Wolf of Snow Hollow from 2020. Have you seen that movie? I happened to see that movie, yes, absolutely. I saw it recently before our hike, and uh, all the howling and so on put me in mind of it. What did you think of that movie? I thought that movie had elements to it that I hope are more meaningful than my initial experience. It had a a skeleton outline, but I feel like there was something that I was missing. Speaking of skeletons, you notice that there aren't many movies, or maybe even no movies, where the main character is a skeleton. That's an important point. I think it's something we need to, to think about really deeply. You have like werewolf movies, you have vampire movies, these traditional monster movies. You have even zombie movies sometimes have a main zombie character. But I've yet to see a main skeleton character in a movie that includes skeletons. Do you hear this, movie producers out there? Right. Yeah. I'm looking for a big box office skeleton movie. Let's put that on the back burner and uh, Mm -hmm. get back to the wolf of Snow Hollow. It takes place in Utah centers around a police officer, a a deputy sheriff, I believe, uh, named John Marshall. This guy is um, unsuited for his work, to say the least. Can you remember any examples of ways that he manifested that unsuitability? He was unhinged at times. He didn't have the patience. He didn't appear to be able to communicate with his staff. He fired people at random, seemingly. (laughs) He uh, was a little challenging to both librarians and suspects along with witnesses i mean mean, it would be difficult for me to find a place in which he was appropriate within his position yeah very very short temper uh recovering alcoholic as well and um his father is the actual sheriff so there's a lot of father-son inadequacy stuff going on i think too and working under him is a very competent seeming officer named uh Julia Robson, she kind of quietly takes the lead uh, as he flails around, I guess I would say. The situation is that there's been a brutal killing, some tourists staying at an Airbnb, and this is all taking place out in a a sort of a mountain village in Utah, snowy in the winter. A young lady is um, killed, but her viscera, her insides are eaten away and her private parts as well. So there's immediate suspicion that it might be an animal attack and there was a paw print left in the snow as well but mr marshall he wants to assume it's a a serial killer and so this all just drives his anxiety and his sense of inadequacy through the roof and he starts lashing out at his colleagues and there's a big fight with the media too because the media starts sort of really criticizing the police and um how they're not making any progress and there's more murders that follow Every time there's another one, pressure on the police department who who are totally unsuited for this level of investigation mounts. And so he's he's fighting off the media and ideas of how his father might have handled this. And meanwhile, his father is ill and um, he, he's got a daughter and, a, and an ex-wife who need his attention. He's just pulled in all these different directions. Personally, I, I felt some sympathy for him. I, I thought that that's did you uh, as well or not? I did not feel much sympathy for the main lead, and that might be the reason why I didn't get a lot out of the movie. I do think that his character was quite fragile, and he obviously had issues with alcohol. Initially, there wasn't much of a backstory as to what his life was like pre-movie, other than the fact that he had battled alcoholism. It seems like the town hadn't experienced such a crime before, so Mm -hmm. it was an overwhelming crime to be happening in this relatively small town him as a high level officer within the police department was barely keeping it together with petty crime 
And then when something significant happens, it just seems to shatter him. He's definitely a, a revolting character, the way he treats people and all that. But there's some sympathy there as well. He's just got too much on his plate. He has too much on his plate, for sure. But he's also in a position, I'm assuming, due to the fact that his father provided him that opportunity. So he didn't earn that role. He was given that role. So you have a guy given a role, not due to his skill set or his abilities, but is gifted this role and is obviously incompetent in the role that's been provided to him. So there are traits within the main character which are unappealing and I would put in the category of didn't provide me with the opportunity to feel sympathy for the main. There's one character in this movie that is highlighted. There are sub characters that I think would have benefited from more background and, but this main character overshadows those opportunities. And because I don't have sympathy for this gentleman, I was kind of pulled out of the movie in an engaging way. And this lends to what I believe some reviewers have referred to as some toxic masculinity within that character. Yeah. And uh, I've got a review here that I'll, that I'll quote that kind of supports that. This is a quotation, a warning to the comment section. This reviewer says, this is undeniably and explicitly a werewolf movie about toxic masculinity. John, the main character, not you, even has a speech about how the myth of the werewolf came about as a way to explain horrific violence against women, often committed in the light of the full moon because it allowed them to see what they were doing. It couldn't be men. It must be the wolf's fault. And the film's final turns only amplify this theme, one that doesn't feel tacked onto the narrative as much as inherently a part of a genre that has long been built on damsels in distress. This time a filmmaker is willing to interrogate what that says about mankind too. Close quote. So all the victims are women. John himself is uh, a toxic to, to everyone, I would say, not just, I guess you can be toxically masculine to men as well. But um, I think there's some question marks around whether the werewolf actually exists. That's a fundamental part of the movie is whether it's a human serial killer or a, a werewolf. I think what the reviewer is saying is that that ambiguity in the movie is meant to reflect the fact that males using this myth of the werewolf, try to hide their toxic... That doesn't make any sense. Try to hide their toxic masculinity. Hmm. I didn't get a sense that the werewolf didn't exist. For a minute, as the plot develops, one wondered if there truly was a werewolf. As the, the movie progresses near the end, then it's like, okay, yeah, this is a guy running around in a suit. But there's some symbolic representation. And so maybe there is some flexibility in allowing for whether the werewolf character existed at all i didn't get that from the movie personally but the ending for me was confusing because there's we see several scenes throughout the film throughout the second half of the film of uh the profile we never see him face face forward the profile of sort of a, a down and out guy he lives in a trailer a very small trailer he's got a very big wolfish looking dog and he is a drug user he's injecting himself with needles there's one scene where he's burning a body. The final scene we have of him, he overdoses and falls out of his trailer door. Right after that, the case is solved. So they found this guy dead and everyone says case closed. This was the guy. He was the werewolf. But later on, John goes to the taxidermist guy, the really, really tall guy, mm -hmm. and suspects him of being the werewolf. And then the audience thinks, oh, it's this taxidermist guy and he just wears this animal skin but mm -hmm. I got the impression when the taxidermist put on the wolf skin and was chasing John through the forest, that was intentionally like it was a skinny little scrawny skin that the tail wasn't, it was just kind of flopping. I thought that we, the audience, were meant to realize that this guy isn't really him, isn't really the werewolf. And so I was just not sure how to interpret all that. What, what did you think of the taxidermist and that final chase scene and so on? That felt very Silence of the Lambs, the way that came together. I didn't get the impression that there was a secondary thought around the audience is supposed to assume that this wasn't the werewolf and, and this character is either doesn't exist or is playing a copycat type behavior. There was a hole there with the drug user at one point was burning a body. Was that intentionally put in the movie so people think that 
oh, this was definitely the guy. I appreciate your efforts in adding meat to these bones because the way I interpreted the movie from first frame to last frame is this is a movie that's written around one main character that is obnoxiously masculine in a sense. We are going to parallel that with a werewolf story. And through this process, we're going to do it with a little bit of dodging and manipulation of the audience. But the core message is just, hey, this guy is a jerk. And guys can be jerks. And hey, look, this is a werewolf. And this is a werewolf narrative that parallels that. And isn't that interesting how there's some parallels there? But I appreciate the effort in considering that the werewolf didn't exist or that person that overdosed and the body that they burned didn't have a red herring type mechanic that would just keep the story moving and trick the audience a little, that there was some substance to it. I didn't see it. I'm curious to hear the narrative that was constructed in your viewing. So if the killer is the taxidermist in the costume, I trusted this movie. I don't think that profile shots of the drug user and then him burning a body were meant to be red herrings because otherwise it seems to me the body burning scene in particular and why bring that guy up if not to suggest that he's the actual werewolf that feels cheap to me and I don't mm -hmm. feel like this movie was made that way. Is it the drug dealer guy who's an actual werewolf or is it the taxidermist guy i guess there's problems in both directions if it's the drug drug user guy who overdosed then that would suggest the taxidermist guy is like a copycat killer mm -hmm. and then why would why would the taxidermist act guilty and attack and kill try to kill he stabs john as well if the taxidermist is not the actual killer so there's there's that direction of the problem mm -hmm. but then if you go in the other direction kind of where you were saying if it is the taxidermist why does that scene in the where he's chasing John in the forest with the very sort of thin, inauthentic looking, and he doesn't even wear a wolf helmet. Mm -hmm. He just sort of drapes on this cheap looking, skinny looking. And then his body movements are all wrong. Like you compare his sort of loping chase in that forest scene in the end with the actual the images of the werewolf itself. When we, the audience see the killings, like the werewolf is humongous and powerful and has the jaws. We see the jaws. We see mm -hmm. the jaws ripping open viscera. The taxidermist can't be doing that in a mm -hmm. costume. Mm -hmm. So I don't uh, know how to resolve that. And I, I felt the same way because there are arms being ripped off of the victims and such, which would require a significant amount of force that it didn't appear the taxidermist had. But the taxidermist did have a severed head in his house. So of one of the victims, you'd have to discount that uh, yeah. to inject this almost conspiracy driven type approach, which I'm not against. It's just is problematic either way as you're kind of introducing. And so that's when it's like, OK, well, if I'm putting these on scales, which one feels more heavier? I assume that the taxidermist was the murderer. Even the triggering event was. This Channing Tatum knockoff guy who was introduced at the beginning finds that he has a the seamstress tool that he finds mm -hmm. and calls one of the police officers and the police officer sees that as a tip. It's kind of like, wow, that isn't part of the investigation. How'd you get that? So is this seamstress tool just fell into the personal belongings of the first victim and then is carried in as evidence. And then this Channing Tatum knockoff finds it and then reports it to the police officer as if it's some significant thing, you know, he probably just would just discard it. Anyways, there's an evidence connection between the first murder and the taxidermist that was mm -hmm. intentionally left to kind of connect these dots. There's also that scene where there's a deer, a dead deer draped across the road and mm -hmm. um, a human handprint on it in mm -hmm. blood. Mm -hmm. And then later when the police investigate the crime scene, that, bit of deer fur has been cut away in a square i didn't remember those scenes but that points towards the taxidermist because he would he would know how to cut animal skins obviously so there could be a third idea here and i think this is a stretch but that there really was a werewolf and that werewolf lived in a motorhome this tall lanky guy knew the werewolf and he wasn't a werewolf he just had the costume so they're both running around out there being goofy, you know, the werewolf person actually having the superhuman strength and ripping off arms. And then this guy, taxidermist, is running around in a costume near him and is making small errors like accidentally killing the deer or purposefully killing the deer and putting the handprint on it. 
and then having to go back and fix the scene so neither of them get caught. That would lend itself to explain why the trailer park guy was burning a body is because he was destroying the corpses that of the individuals he was murdering as a as a werewolf. And then taxidermist was then taking some of the victims and having his way with them or creating art out of them. Who knows? So this movie obviously has a whodunit aspect. And I wanted to quote a second review, which I think uh, will give us some fodder. Quoting here, you don't need to have supernatural creatures in your midst to have monsters on the loose. This reviewer says there are enough bad men on display in this film to suggest any number of potential human forms for its beast and enough dismissive comments, misogynistic asides and X, Y chromosome creepiness that the werewolf factor feels more like a symptom than the disease itself. It ends on an overheard comment that suggests one obvious hunter down an endless supply of less identifiable predators to go. And I think he's referring to that scene where he drops off his daughter at the university and those two Mm -hmm. bros. Yeah. The review concludes Thunder Road, which was Jim Cummings first movie. Thunder Road bowed out with a man finally staring down his own toxicity and being determined to do better. This film hints at the notion that the problem is much, much bigger than one bad guy. Yeah. That's the end of that quote. Mm -hmm. So there's, the taxidermist, and then the the possibility of the drug user being an actual werewolf. You were kind of saying maybe there's two killers, basically, Mm -hmm. working in tandem. Yeah, I forgot about that severed head scene. Um, And then it would make sense that the drug user was burning the body of that headless corpse. But I feel like in the other crime scenes, the body is left, and there's just part of it is eaten. So I don't know what to do with that. And then another thing that did you notice that John Marshall had kind of sharp incisors throughout the whole movie? Yeah, I did. Well, notice and, that. and there was some scene where he yanked out a loose tooth or something. That's got to be suggestive. No, I, I think so. I, and as I was, I was watching this, I was thinking this would probably make for a better four or five part Netflix series where it would dissect these little cues of curiosities because it has to be distilled to a hour and 30 minute movie that it doesn't have the chance to explore all these things. That is me giving more credit to the director and writer who is the same guy, or it could be the purpose of the movie is just to flash these toxic masculinity principles and display them in ways, but there isn't really a a thread of coherence because it's not required. The whole point is just to, take the viewer on this symbolic series of experiences to flash these toxic masculinity situations. And then also enjoy the fact that this is a mysterious movie where you're not sure if it's a werewolf or not. And also insert your own werewolf mythology as it relates to an excuse for men's bad behavior. Yeah. I'm just, I'm uncomfortable. Like with, I feel like there needs to be only one, killer whether it's the Mm -hmm. werewolf or the taxidermist or somebody else i don't think there's more than one Mm -hmm. and then i'm i'm also into this suggestion that the reason john marshall has sharp teeth and uh there's so many other males in, in this movie too that are that are jerks to women in various ways that the movie's trying to say any male is a potential threat a potential werewolf quote unquote werewolf mm hmm and and every woman is a potential victim of any random male. I want both of those to be true. I want there to be mm-hmm. one killer and not two. And I want there to, but I also want this theme of all males are potential, potentially toxic to work. So the ending that I, the way that I interpret the ending, it was the taxidermist. Mm-hmm. Whatever reason the cops thought it was the drug dealer is incorrect. Mm-hmm. The cops were wrong. To, right. to assume I, case was closed. That could be an easy s- suggestion that it's a small town police department. Yeah. And they're just relieved by the fact that there's a, a solution, although the solution in itself makes them seem incompetent. But OK, just as shocking as this came on, it's just as easy to dismiss because, well, we didn't even understand it to begin with. Right. But then if that's if that's true and the police are just incompetent and the case was still open and the killer was still at loose, 
what are we to make of the very, very large and the animal bites and the um, claw prints and the superhuman powers of this werewolf compared to the skinny, inauthentic looking skin that like, are those murder scenes that we were treated to elaborations or like meant to suggest that this is how the community is viewing this crime. Whereas in reality, we're not really seeing the actual murder. The actual murder was just a very tall taxidermist in kind of an unconvincing wolf skin cutting out the viscera of women to make it look like a wolf. I don't know what to make of the vividness of those killings, the scenes of those killings versus the thinness of the taxidermist costume. So to resolve this, the suggestion is that the community was viewing the human inflicted wounds with a exaggerated animalistic cutting off of arms and legs and, mm. and of organs and such. So the, the reality is that the victims were stabbed or something that a human could do. And then, and then the taxidermist cut out some part of their body as part of his killing rituals. And then all the werewolf scenes we see is meant to reflect the community's suspicion that it's a werewolf. I feel like there's a lot of bending going on to get the movie to fit a comfortable and acceptable shape. I'm still of the side, which is a bit unusual, that it was not constructed carefully enough and that the complaint is that those pieces, as much as we'd want them to be there, just don't exist. And I know that the writer-director is integral into the solution of this possibility of something more than what appears on the, on the surface. I'm not familiar with the director and writer. I'm not sure if you have more thoughts on that. No, I didn't know anything about him. His name is Jim Cummings. He wrote the movie, directed it, and plays the lead role. And I believe this movie had a pretty small budget. Clearly a work of uh, love, and uh, I learned a little bit about him through some reviews. And apparently this is his second movie. And some reviewers were critical that the first movie he did was called Thunder Road. The character, apparently, I haven't seen Thunder Road, but the character that he plays in that film is very, very similar to this one. I believe he's also a policeman, also kind of a nervous wreck and, and toxically masculine. So there's broadly similar themes in each film, which some critics thought disappointing. One critic called Cummings, quote, the poet laureate of male repression, unquote, which I thought was interesting. Another quick quote from a reviewer, it's the personal demons rather than old fashioned monsters that get you see, which is one of two central tenets of Cummings genre exercise slash portrait of a fuck up mash up, end quote. So, <laughs> so this guy, Jim Cummings, clearly through both movies seems to um, seems to be into this theme of uh, toxic masculinity or, or yeah, whatever or male repression might suggest. But yeah, I just thought it was uh, interesting that he's very well thought of in the movie making world. And the fact that he's uh, he does a lot of advocacy for independent movies, I guess, kind of anti Hollywood establishment, you know, having to having to secure a large budget and sort of get the blessings of profit seeking production companies and all that. So he's got an independent streak, which um, I thought was cool as well. Mm -hmm. But just the fact that he did so much in the film, directing and acting and writing at the same time. I found that really impressive. I don't know how common that is. Yeah, he was the main lead. So I felt it was a bit egotistical that like he would take the lead in the movie that he wrote and mm -hmm. directed uh, as if no one else would be able to be competent or be yeah. able to express his vision in the movie itself made him the lead and made him the, the character study. And, and through that, discounted or didn't allow for the other characters to grow or to be seen in the movie. And this is kind of the disappointment I had in the movie is, and I realized that it has a certain thread of a message, which I, I think is, is fine that it's in the movie. And I think that it's kind of gives it texture, but it, it does so at the expense of allowing other interesting characters that are created in the movie to express themselves more fully. And so it's like, okay, well, is he embodying his own message here? 
that he as an individual has to write, direct, and act in the fullest capacity within this movie that overshadows everyone else. And so is he toxic masculinity personified? Like, is that his point here? But e either way, it kind of, that's what kind of left me a little empty at the end is sort of like, okay, so was that drug dealer a throwaway red, red herring? Some of these jokes were kind of funny. Some of them weren't that funny. Why is this main character who is repulsive taking up 90% of the oxygen in the room and he's the writer and director? Could be completely intentional. Hats off for him to create something like that. It also could have some level of unawareness to itself, which is kind of the area that I was picking up on, where it, it doesn't do a good enough service to its own message. And the director is trying to do more than he has the potential or, or possibility to do. And that in itself put too much weight and kind of crushed what could be a more interesting movie, this sort of skeleton that didn't have as, as, as what it could have had was, was more. I guess I agree with you to an extent. Like he's a, is he, John Marshall is a very big character, clearly the main character with a capital M, but uh, I guess I would push back a little bit. He, I don't think he drowns out the other characters. I think, you know, that, that idea of being a foil, I think he's a foil to some other characters. One in particular is Julia Robeson, the, the female police officer who really mm -hmm. ought to be sheriff. Like, I think there's several scenes where the way he acts and then her subsequent actions, sort of picking up the pieces and cleaning up his mess, mm -hmm. you know, because he acts so outrageously and highlights what a better police officer she is and how she keeps her cool and is more empathic with people they're interviewing and stuff and, and all that. And then another character that I think he, through his brightness, kind of lets us see better is the daughter, the daughter Jenna. We get a little bit of development of her. She's got to deal with this completely irresponsible father who's um, personally um, destructive and, and reverting to his alcoholism and uh, and a loose cannon and all this sort of thing. And, and she's just trying to sort of get out of the house and get away and get to college and, and pursue her gymnastics and her education. Through his outrageous behavior in the family setting, we empathize more with the daughter. So I, I think, yeah, he's definitely a big character, but I feel like through that bigness, we uh, see more of the some of these other characters too. Hmm. The fact that you have this large character bumping through the plot line and the only st steering characteristics that are provided to him are the women around him kind of give more voice to the idea of discrediting those actresses or actors in the sense where their role is only to steer him. So they're only a subproduct of his presence, which diminish their independent motivations and, and, and behaviors through the movie. They're only in his orbit and are influenced by him, which I see it gives them an opportunity to present themselves, but only in the service of him, uh, yeah. which, you know, kind of is a bit obnoxious, but you know, on a, on a psychological orientation here, there's a body of theory of object relations where it's in a, in a way, you know, he as a human being who's operating within a society and humans are strongly tied to societal steers and influences. And at what point in the movie, he does mention that when you're having a nervous breakdown, the only evidence that it's happening are those around you who ask, how are you doing? Like, mm -hmm. are you, are you doing okay? And the person is blinded by the experience that they're having. And this is sort of a concept within object relations where it's, there's an integration from external objects. And then that is then integrated into the person. And then that person then makes that external object part of them. This is a message that appears to be within the movie, but I think a lot of people would find it off-putting is that and I think this is what the movie is somewhat saying is the solution to toxic masculinity is individuals external to that person who that toxic masculine individual can implement into their persona or their psychology to then operate in the world differently. That unfortunately lends itself or at least that that toxic masculine person is then the responsibility of others to fix in a sense. I don't know if that message is purposefully 
stitched into this movie, but a couple of times it comes up where it's, I'm having problems. I am having a nervous breakdown as it might be listed in the movie, or I'm just toxically masculine. And the only way that this can be fixed is for women in my environment in orbit to influence me to not be like this. And if they're not there, I'm just going to continue to operate in this way. And it unfortunately leans on others to fix another individual's problems. Yeah, I feel like Julia Robson, the, the female officer, is always trying to steer him on the job. He does have that Alcoholics Anonymous group, too, who we never see the faces of, but I think some of them are men. Mm -hmm. So he is getting support, at least some support from males as well. Just uh, maybe to wrap up, John Marshall's father is an actor named Robert Forster. He's done a lot of famous roles, and I understand that this was his final role before he passed away. So I just wanted to mention that, and several reviews uh, noted that fact. I got the impression he died during the filming, uh, but I'm not oh. sure about that, or sh shortly after. But the, the movie was dedicated to him in the credits, so uh, just a, a little footnote on him. Hmm. He died both in the movie and during the filming of the movie. What are your kind of final thoughts on this? I know that typically we take on slightly different roles. I'm normally the person defending the movie and you're normally the person who's uh, <laughs> sort of uh, deconstructing it or, or, or taking the movie for what it is and putting the responsibility on the director to provide the substance as opposed to expecting the audience to build the narrative that's been missing. And I, I think that throughout this, you've put more emphasis on giving more substance to the movie than it may appear to have in its first viewing. And I don't, I don't know how, what your kind of conclusions of that are. Yeah. I, I guess it comes back to that intuition I have of any movie I watch is like, and I've said this before is like, do I feel like I'm in the hands of someone who knows what they're doing? And I absolutely did with this film, the dialogue I thought was excellent. Very witty, lots of hilarious little aside side comments. Certainly many of them are inappropriate, but um, there was humor. There was care in the visual filming. There, There's that wonderful scene, I remember, where uh, all the police officers are meeting, looking at the crime scene photos, and John is not conducting the meeting well, as usual. He's, he's freaking out that werewolves don't exist. And then, uh, I don't know, he like physically attacks one of the one of his work <laughs> colleagues, and he has to be dragged out of the office. And, it's, and then he runs into his dad. There's no dialogue, but the, the camera just zooms over to Julia Ropes and the female, and then it zooms back to the father, and you see that the father was looking at her, and you can tell immediately that the father is thinking, you know, I had to give this stupid son of mine this job, and I regret doing it, and I'm about to die, and um, she would really have been the better choice, and, and should, I, should I fire him and sort of, uh, you know, lose my family legacy, but help the police department? And all that was communicated so elegantly just in that camera movement. So the yes or no for me from the beginning is, is this movie made with care or not? And uh, yes, I, I felt that it was. So my, my takeaway adjective is ambitious for our listeners. Um, this is a very ambitious movie. I think there are problems with it, as we've discussed. And later, the things that I learned about this guy, Jim Cummings, and how unorthodox he is, and that it was kind of a passion project and, and low budget added to that impressive um uhness <laughs> that impression so yeah i thought it was ambitious and i think it's worth seeing i, I would t i would totally see it again to to try and catch more of these little easter eggs about the whodunit story now that i know kind of how it ends so yeah I, I i hear what you're saying i'm usually more critical than you are but um i don't know what accounts for that but i uh i think this one is a, a gem hmm. Hmm, very good yeah i like i like the role reversal yeah i didn't quite see the same level of depth or value in it. I think that it was illustrating a point which it did a good job in doing, but I felt that there were loose ends that were untidy without purpose. What's the real answer? That's up for you to decide, dear listener. Did you did you put the werewolf traps down? I put the werewolf traps down. Next play time we stop in town, I'm going to look for some skeleton uh, nets. <laughs> um, bear spray is uh, all checked off, so we're just going to be safe. <laughs> That's the keyword, John. <laughs> but how do we how do we protect ourselves from males and toxic masculinity? That's a bigger issue. That's a bigger issue. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So. All right, buddy. Till the next uh, blaze. All right. Sounds good. <laughs>